listening to Anna, she, she read the passage there. I concerned me how I'm going to tell the story in the school. You know, am I going to be able to turn a, sna- a stick into a snake or turn it back? I, I doubt it. I think we might just have to use some other visual uh, things there for the kids. I, I was thinking I could do the leprous bit uh, using an oven glove tucked in my shirt or something. But uh, the reason that we, we do that in the school, I is one to, to make the story stick in the young minds, but also because some of the children don't even speak English. So we have to be very visual when we, we teach them the stories from the Bible. Uh, not only is English not their first language, it's really not their language at all yet. And uh, we have to try and show them uh, how we, we can do this. And, you know, this is quite quite apt because God in the readings today I said we've got to show Pharaoh not just tell him I actually got to show him I if you just tell him he won't listen he won't pay attention and so God determined that his man for the job would be Moses. Let's look back a little bit into to Moses' history. Moses, born an Israelite in captivity in Egypt. At the time when Pharaoh had decided that uh, there were too many Israelite people and they might keep growing and they might reach the stage where they would usurp the Egyptian authority and take over the land. And so Pharaoh said, right, to avoid this, let's kill off all the children under two years old, all the boys under two. And then that will solve the problem for a little while. I don't know what his intention was after that, but that was his his initial thought. Does that remind you of anything in the New Testament? Kill all the boys under two years old. We remember when Herod gave the same decree after the the wise men had come to see him seeking Jesus. So if there's a threat, let's get rid of the threat. Let's destroy the threat and then we don't need to worry. That was Herod's idea and that was also Pharaoh's idea at the time. But from the family of Moses, they decided that that was an unjust and an evil ruling and they weren't going to obey it. They were going to obey God rather than man. And so Moses mother and father probably discussed what to do with a young child and the decision was made to hide him in the bulrushes and his older sister was given the job of keeping an eye on him until the day of course when Pharaoh's daughter went to bathe and heard the baby crying in the, in the bulrushes had her servants find out who it was and then she decided to adopt this little child. Imagine that situation when she went back to the palace and said to her father, Pharaoh, I've found this baby and I want to keep it. But it's an Israelite. That's all right. Well, we'll, we'll change him. We'll make him Egyptian. I'm sure the thoughts must have gone something like that. And so they did. They sent him to to school and he grew up in the palace and he grew up as a an Egyptian prince, prince of Egypt, Moses. And yet when Moses was a little boy, 
his nursemaid for the prince or the princess was his own mother. And so he would be told the, the truth about the situation. So then as he grew up, can you imagine him having a divided loyalties to his foster parent and to his God? You know, which way should I go? Which way? And then the decision was made one day when he was out and he saw the Egyptian taskmaster beating up some of the Israelite slaves and Moses the anger rose up within him and he went out and he he killed the Egyptian taskmaster and hid his body in the sand it was fine he thought he'd got away with it until a little later when he saw two Israelite men arguing and he went to see them and said come on stop your your nonsense stop arguing and they turned to him and they said or what are you going to kill us as well at that point Moses realized that what he did had been seen and he fled the country he fled and went off to the land of Midian and hid there now just to give you a little bit of his background when this happened he was about 40 years old. Okay, so 40 years growing up in the palace and then ran off to escape judgment, to escape punishment, to the land of Midian. And there, the prince of Egypt became a shepherd. And we've spoken before about shepherds, how they're, they were treated as the lowest of the low. What a come down from Prince down to Shepherd. And that was what he did for the next 40 years. As a shepherd, out in the desert, looking after sheep, until the day when he saw the burning bush. I'm quite sure that having been in the desert for 40 years, he'd be used to seeing burning bushes. It gets hot in the desert. The sun strikes might strike a bit of silicon in the sand, mirrors up, a flash, a spark, and woof, the bush is gone. But this one didn't. It stayed there. It kept burning. But it didn't burn out. So Moses went to investigate, and there he found, when he got close, that the bush was only meant to attract his attention, to get him thinking. And suddenly a voice from heaven said, Moses, take off your shoes, for the ground you're standing on is holy. We got the kids to do that, uh, but uh, you can keep yours on this morning if you want. We had a race to see who could take off their shoes quickest. I believe it or not, it was the headmistress. She beat all the, the children in doing it. And so God challenged Moses that day and said to him, I have a job for you. And this is where we, we picked up the story this morning. And we read in chapter 3 and verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? You could say the same this morning. Who am I? What's special about me? Why should I do something big and special? Why should Moses do something big and special? And the reason being was that God had chosen him for that job. God didn't choose Aaron, his brother, to lead the children of Israel. He chose Moses. Moses who had been out of contact with the children of Israel for more or less all his life. But God said, I want you to do this job. And so Moses says, who? Me? Never. I'm not going to do that. 
I'm not ready for it. I'm not equipped for it. I just don't want to do it. Forget it, God. Find somebody else. But no. What did God say in the very next verse? Verse 12. And God said, I will be with you. You see? No, Moses couldn't have done the job on his own. With God at his side, he could do it. God directing Moses. God giving him the right words to say. But Moses was still having none of it. How often do we fight against God when he wants us to do something? And we read in verse 13, the excuses start to mount up. Moses said to God, supposing I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your father has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? He's going to the Israelites to tell them, God has sent me to you. They're not going to believe me. So what should I tell them? Well, God says, uh, what to us would sound a little strange. God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's what you have to say to the Israelites. I am sent me to you. When we use that expression, I am, we are using it with sincerity. We're using it with security. We are using it with confidence. I am Ken. I am the pastor in this church. I know I am. I'm sure I am. We've all heard that little ditty. It then goes on to say I'm H-A-P-P-Y, but I know who I am. Sometimes people are not sure who they are. But here we have in this verse, in verse 14 of Exodus chapter 3, God says, I am. He knows who he is. He knows who each of us are. But he is specific in saying, I am. No other title. The I am. You know, you, you wouldn't go down to the, the shops and order a, a kilo of carrots and say, I am has sent me. You might say, I want a kilo of carrots. Or you might say, Mary has asked me to come and get some carrots. But I am. Strange title, but yet the most accurate title you can have because God is, God was, God will be, and so he knows who he is. And he sends the instruction to Moses to go and tell them that I am, that God has sent you. But Moses doesn't give up at that stage. He doesn't say, okay, right, I'm off to do it. Next chapter, Moses says, but what if they don't believe me or listen to me or say, the Lord didn't appear to you? And if you may meet people and when you try and tell them about Jesus, they, they will say similar things. They won't believe you. Or they'll say, what do you mean he spoke to you? What do you mean that he... So Moses was given the instructions of how to do these signs and wonders to make people, people sit up and think. Take your staff, throw it in the ground. Oh, that was easy. Throw the staff in the ground. The next part, Moses had no control over it. It turned into a snake. And we actually read that Moses jumped back. What on earth is happening now? Now, I don't know how many people here are afraid of snakes. Many people are afraid of snakes. What would you do if God said to you, well, go and pick it up? Hey, would you? I know there are some people in in America that have tried to make a religion out of this wrongly I, because they are taking one tiny little verse in the Bible out of context and they've built their own religion around this 
But Moses would have been in fear and trembling, I believe, when he went to pick that up. And when he picked it up, there was his faithful old staff in his hand because it was God that was doing the job. And God says, in case they don't believe that, take your hand, put it inside your shirt, or inside your cloak, and draw it out again. And suddenly, it was diseased. Do it again. And suddenly, it's restored. Because God has the power to do these things that man cannot do. Well, you would think, you know, you've, you've met God at the burning bush. He's spoken to you. He said, you can do it. And look, here's some signs and wonders that will prove that you can do it. It still wasn't enough for Moses. He's still not up for it. He doesn't want to go and lead the children of Israel. He doesn't want to go and stand before Pharaoh. So no, some more excuses as he brings them out. As we read in chapter 4, verse 10, Moses is becoming just a little bit more respectful to God, though. Moses says, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. I remember having this explained to me a while back by and for Caroline, this is quite uh, quite easy being a language teacher. I believe Moses spoke three languages. He spoke Egyptian, he spoke Hebrew, and whatever the Midianites spoke. But remember, as a Hebrew, he probably hadn't spoken that from he was about five years old. He would be taught everything by his mother. And then it would have been pushed to the back as he learned the Egyptian, as he learned the the way of the, the courts of Pharaoh. And then 40 years in Midian. In fact, he could probably speak to the sheep better than he could speak to anyone else. So he says, you know, I'm slow of speech. I can't think back of how to speak properly. We have a a sign up in the school I, which says I use it or lose it speaking about learning Spanish if you don't use it you'll forget it and we know that when the swallows come back after six months away of not using it some have almost got to start at the beginning again and this is where Moses is he says, I've forgotten it all I can't string a sentence together Perhaps that's your excuse for not doing something for God. Oh, I can't manage it. It's too difficult. I'll not remember that. I can't say that. I'm too embarrassed to do it. God doesn't accept excuses. When he gives us a job to do, he provides the tools for us to do it. So what does he do? He says, he doesn't say, well, okay, you can't speak, so we'll give the job to someone else. I like this verse because God says, even while we're talking about this, your brother Aaron is on his way to meet you. Thinking that, Aaron probably hasn't seen Moses for 70 years. He had no idea where he was. But God directed him direct to Midian where Moses was. And he says, he's on his way now. Aaron was the, the spokesperson for Moses in all the dealings with Pharaoh. So if we look at that and think about that, 
when God directs his people, when God gives them something to do, he always provides a way to do it. Moses was the leader, and yet he wasn't the spokesperson. That's very unusual. Normally a leader stands up in front and speaks, and people listen to him. But in these early days, Moses was the leader, but he had a spokesperson, his brother Aaron, who spoke on his behalf. It wasn't always that way with Moses. And I believe that in these early days that Moses was probably picking up the strains of the language once again so that when they left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea that he was able to assume the full responsibility as leader of the children of Israel and to speak to them in everything that he did. But initially, weak and timid and not really willing to do the job. Is that us? Has God been placing on your heart to do something and you're finding excuses not to do it? To speak to somebody and you're finding excuses not to, to speak to them? Moses couldn't do it on his own. God didn't expect him to do it on his own. And there's the proof there that God had already prepared the spokesperson for Moses to use. Because even as Moses is debating with God that I can't do this, I'm not able to do it, God says, your brother's already on his, on his way here and he will speak for you. So does God direct his people? Does God speak to his people? Does God give us instruction? Does God expect us to respond to that instruction? The answer to all of these is yes. God knows our limitations and God will always provide himself for when our limitations are too restrictive. He will provide a way for us to, to serve him. He'll provide a person to help us. He will provide whatever is necessary, whatever tools we need to serve him. He will provide. He doesn't leave us without. But what he doesn't do is he doesn't accept us sitting back saying, no, can't do it, not for me. Let someone else do it. If God has a task for you to do, he expects you to do it. No one else. He has a task for someone else to do that you can't do. But he only gives you to do what you are equipped, what you are able to do. And he gives us his grace to do it. But, you know, he doesn't expect us to do anything for him at all if we don't know him. He has clearly said in his word that if we try to do things on our own strength, that we will fail. If we try to do good things on our own for him, they will fail. Your good works, the Bible tells us, are like filthy rags towards God. That's not very pleasant. I'm doing my best. And God's saying, it's no use. It's useless. How can that be? Because God looks at everything we do through his son, through the Lord Jesus Christ. If we believe in his son, if we trust his son to be our personal savior, if we walk with him, then everything we do is for God's kingdom. If we miss out that step, then everything we do is really for ourselves. Might make us feel better that we've done something good, but if we are in the kingdom of God through the blood of the Lord Jesus, then we are expected, indeed we're commanded, to do his will, and he equips us for it. He directs us. 
He leads us. He will help us and guide us. As we sang this morning, guide me, O thou great Jehovah. I am weak, but you are mighty. Hold me with your powerful hand. This morning, he has a job for us to do. I don't know what your job is. God gives you that himself. Don't turn it down. Don't make excuses. Accept his help, his guidance, his wisdom in how you do the job. Because he will give you the tools for it, like he did with Moses. Might be simple tools. His staff, the thing that he used every day, God was able to use that to show his power and his might. So when he gives you a job to do, seek his strength and his help to do it for his kingdom. Not because you want to do it, but because he wants you to do it. And he never asks us beyond what we're capable of doing. But he gives us the strength to do that. Amen.